Good day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We apologize for the technical difficulties we had with the initial presentation. So hopefully this live record, this recording will answer, uh, will take the place of that episode. So this is an update on immune TTP. And here are my disclosures, which represent mainly the research work that I've done in TTP. And so just a little background on myself. Uh, my name is Aaron Metchin. I'm an adult benign hematologist. I was recently recruited to the uh, Division of Hematology at the University of Colorado, where my focus is on hemostasis and thrombosis with a particular attention on TTP. And what I'd like to talk about briefly is just an explanation on immune TTP, the updates that are out, and then the work that still needs to be done in the treatment of TTP. So first, just a brief explanation on just what is immune TTP. So thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura is this life-threatening, deadly disease that has to do with a major abnormality of von Willebrand factor processing. And classically, this has been known as this PENTAD. That's the way we were taught in med school. These five signs and symptoms that are associated with TTP, which is low platelet counts, red cells that have been destroyed or known as schistocytes, acute kidney injury, fevers, and mental status changes. And even though these are the classic signs of TTP, what we really know is that all we really need is a low platelet count, a markedly decreased platelet count, and evidence of destroyed red blood cells, this microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And that's all we really need in order to diagnose someone with having TTP and to move forward. And this is what blood normally looks like. This cell in the middle are the white blood cell. This is, this is a neutrophil. These red cells all around are, um, are the red blood cells. And these little purple dots that are all around here, that, those are the platelets. However, this is what a patient with TTP, what their blood film looks like. This, the, this is the microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, or the schistocytes. And as all the yellow arrows point to, these are the broken, the fragmented cells uh, that we see on the peripheral blood film. This is why it is so important for us to look at the blood film if we think that someone has TTP. And so what does this have to do with von Willebrand factor? So real brief, this is what the basic subunit of von Willebrand factor looks like. I tell my patients, think of this as like a Swiss Army knife, right, where each one of those letters represents a different domain, a different function, a different role that von Willebrand factor is playing. This D prime domain is where von Willebrand factor binds to factor eight. That is the protein that is deficient in hemophilia A. Von Willebrand factor serves as a carrier, greatly prolonging its half-life. These A1, A3 domains on the top, that's what allows von Willebrand factor to bridge when the red blood cell has been broken to collagen underneath. This 2B3A binding site is what allows von Willebrand factor to cause platelets to aggregate, to link with each other. And what we'll talk about later is this 1B binding site. This is what allows platelets to adhere to von Willebrand's factor and is very key in the role of TTP. And we'll talk about this later. Now, the smallest part that circulates is just two of these von Willebrand factors hooked together. And this is 600 kilodaltons, which is a pretty sizable protein. This is about four times the size of an immunoglobulin. However, usually dozens and dozens and dozens of these von Willebrand factors are just linked together in, uh, via their CK domains. And so that von Willebrand factor is the largest protein that circulates within the human body. And what this has to do with TTP is that there's an enzyme, this Adam TS13, I'm sure everyone has heard this over and over again. Adam TS13 is this metalloproteinase or an enzyme. And what it does, it cuts the von Willebrand factor into the appropriate sizes so that it could be into its right shape. And usually if someone has TTP, it's due to an immune mediated reaction. So in other words, the immune system has decided to target this one specific enzyme as opposed to someone who was born without it. That would be congenital TTP. And in the absence of Adam TS13, that von Willebrand factor gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it gets so big that it leads to these pathogenic ultra-large multimers. This is what it looks like normally. 
and this is someone with congenital TTP who's in remission, and they've got these ultra large molecules, these huge polymer of von Willebrand factor. And what happens? That von Willebrand factor cannot fold correctly. It cannot stay compacted. Think of it like duct tape or a roll of flypaper. And then it just spontaneously opens up. And all of those A1 domains, dozens upon dozens of A1 domains are, by, are open and able to bind platelets. So like beads on a string, all those platelets are binding to von Willebrand factors and they bind in three dimension. A string going this way, a string going this way, a string going back and forth. So this three-dimensional ball of platelets and von Willebrand factor is created and it circulates until it blocks the pipe. The body tries to pump red blood cells through it, which leads to the fragmentation of the red blood cells. But this causes blockage of blood flow to the brain, the heart, the kidneys, the pancreas. That leads to all the problems of it. And when we suspect that someone has TTP, we emergently start plasma exchange and high-dose steroids. And the reason we do this, this was done. I mean, this was published in 1991. This is now over 30 years ago, where we sh where it was shown that plasma exchange led to a lower death rate than just simply infusing in plasma. And the reason we do plasma exchange is, you know, you could argue that it does four processes in one. When we're taking out the plasma from this one side, it removes the inhibitor and it removes those pathogenic ultra large multiples of von Willebrand factor. When we're bringing in plasma with the exchange, we're giving normal atom TS13, and we're also replacing the plasma with normal amounts of von Willebrand factor. This was a major game changer because it took this disease that had a nearly 100% fatality rate and dropped it down to about 20%. And even though this is great, this is a significant improvement still, 20% death rate still means that one out of five people who present with TTP, despite our best efforts, will still die as a result. And this is especially important because we know that in our patients, TTP tends to predominantly affect our patients of African descent, and it tends to be particularly more predominant in the Southeast. So now that we've talked about a brief explanation on what is ITTP, here are the updates. So we can talk about, are there any updates in the diagnosis, how we treat with plasmapheresis, how we treat, you know, just ITP in general, and on immune suppression. So how do we diagnose TTP? We need to show that there is an absence, a virtual absence of Adam TS13 activity, not a little bit of a decrease. It's not 60 or 50 or even 30%, but it's less than 10%. And if we want to show that it's immune mediated, we have to show that there is an autoantibody, an inhibitor or a clearing antibody that is reducing the activity down to less than 10%. Otherwise, we risk treating someone with congenital TTP as though they have immune TTP. There are a number of different assays that are being used in order to detect, is there an absence of Adam TS13 activity? The most popular one now is this fluorescence, energy, <laughs> fluorescence resonance energy transfer. And this is, this is what so this FRET VWF73, what it is, is a P, it's a 73 amino acid piece of von Willebrand factor. So it's just a little nugget of it. And where you see this part that says A2PR, two amino acids have been replaced there. And these two, and what they've put on are these two other probes. This, uh, where it shows that NMA and the DNP, that NMA, um, that yellow, where the yellow arrow is pointing, that is a fluorescent tag. Think of it as like a signal. And that purple tag is a quencher. In other words, it's binding, it's covering up that fluorescent probe. And the way the assay is performed is that if there is Adam TS13, Adam TS13 snips with that dorky little uh, green scissor representing Adam TS13. It snips in between tyrosine, which is that Y, and methionine, which is M. And then it releases, it separates out that, that, that signal from the quencher, which we can then measure. And so here's a cartoon image of it. And this is what it looks like. If there is a functional amount of Adam TS13, 
it will separate the quencher from the probe. And then as there is more Atom TS-13 activity, what we'll see is more and more release of the probe with higher amounts of fluorescence that's created. And so we can then tell based upon how much fluorescence is created in the test tube, that directly represents how much Atom TS-13 is in the sample. And so that is now currently the active uh, method that is being used to diagnose TTP. Have there been any improvements in plasma phoresis? Well, really not a whole lot. It's the, in, in essence, pretty much about the same procedure that's been going on for the last 30 years. And what we talk about is, well, instead of FFP, instead of plasmas or anything else that we can do, there is a relatively new product known as Octoplas, and that is pooled plasma. And that we can use for patients who have marked allergic reactions, just plain old FFP. So if anyone is having a lot of reactions to, to fresh frozen plasma, an alternative can be used, uh, can be this, this, new, this new product called Octoplas. Other things that we've talked about, is should we taper plasma phoresis or not? Should we use less or more plasma? But honestly, none of those have really panned out to being anything of, of significant value. So how about in treating TTP? The biggest one by far is the use of capilacizumab in the treatment of immune TTP. Um, this is the first and only medication that is approved for use in TTP. And this is something that's completely new. It's not plasma phoresis, it's not immune suppression, but it's a nanobody that binds to that A1 domain of von Willebrand factor. So you remember that cartoon I showed of that little, that little snippet of von Willebrand? Um, A1, the A1 domain, that is the part that binds to platelets. And this completely prevents that abnormal platelet binding to von Willebrand factor. And so for those of you who don't know, it begs the question, well, what the heck is a nanobody? And so what, we've, what has been found is that camels, llamas, alpacas, certain sharks can make a, what's called a heavy chain only antibody. And I'll show that in a second. And this was a bunch of immunology grad students in Belgium who were messing around and they found this. So here's what our normal antibody looks like. Here's this part down here. This, this stem is what's called the constant region. And up here is this variable, this VH and VL are variable heavy and variable light chains. And this is the business end of an antibody. This is what binds to is what the antibody binds to. And we, and we need both parts of this, if you have a heavy and a light chain, in order to bind to its target. And it's a rather big molecule, 150 kilodaltons. A nanobody is just this. It is just this variable heavy chain. And what this is good about this is that you can rip this piece off, and this piece will bind to the, to the, the target of choice unlike that of like a regular antibody. And this is a tenth of the size of a regular of a regular antibody, which means we can give it subcutaneously instead of having to give it in the veins. Caplicizumab, what they've done is they immunized llamas against the A1 domain, took those took those nano those those variable heavy chains, put a linker in, which is our three alanine amino acids, and now this is, can be administered subcutaneously. The phase two trial was the Titan trial, which I'm gonna skip over. I'm gonna go straight to the phase three Hercules trial. And this was one of the, this was the largest clinical trial in immune TTP. 145 patients in over 20 centers around the world where patients either were treated with plasma exchange, steroids, or rituximab, or they also they were treated that way and they also got caplicizumab. And the results were so effective that the IS, the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, now recommends using caplicizumab either upfront or in patients with a, with a relapse. So what did they what did the Hercules trial looked at? First things first, how quickly can I get to a platelet count of 150? That is our surrogate marker for saying, yes, the TTB process has quieted down. That's how we know there's no more flames, there's no more smoke. Sustained platelet count of 150 for two days is what we use as saying, okay, we have treated the TTP. And of course, you do a big enough trial, we want all these secondary outcomes. Is there death? Is there recurrence? 
it, are there any blood clots? And what is the rate of someone getting refractory, uh, refractory TTP? And how quickly can we show a normalization of these biomarkers? LDH is what we see when red blood cells are destroyed. Troponin is a marker for cardiac damage, for heart damage. And creatinine is a marker of how well the kidneys are working. What we found was that being on Kaplacizumab significantly shortened the time to platelet count recovery. And the way, the way this graph is done is mostly for statistical reasons. And if you're having trouble about thinking about this, you can also flip it upside down, that might be better. But this blue line represents those patients who are on Kaplacizumab. The red line represents those who are on placebo. And this is the number of patients who had, like how long it took to normalize the platelet count. And you can see that it went faster to normalize the platelet count if you were on Kaplacizumab versus those who were on placebo, it took them longer. In addition to the secondary outcomes, patients who were on Kaplacizumab had less of that combined endpoint. So in other words, for this combined endpoint of death, recurrence, and blood clots, only nine versus 36. And what I think is very important there were no deaths in the Kaplacizumab arm, but three in the, in the standard of care arm. Again, you know, this, is, this just shows that despite our best efforts, this study was done in high volume TTP centers, places where there's a lot of expertise in TTP, we still can have death with TTP. Patients, while they were on Kaplacizumab, had less recurrences, right? Both during, the period, both during the treatment period and then afterwards. As you can see, higher rates of exacerbations, which is a flare-up of the TTP within 30 days. Other secondary outcomes, just as important, less days on plasma exchange, less days hospitalized, less days spent in the ICU. Now, what's the, now, what's the other side of the coin there? What are the safety reasons, the safety worries with Kaplacizumab? The biggest one is just mucosal associated bleeding. And this is expected because this is what we're doing. We're blocking platelets from binding to its natural target of von Willebrand's. And that's usually related to things like nosebleeds, gum bleeding, nothing that was considered, uh, that was considered out of the ordinary. But ultimately, the biggest drawback to the use of Kaplacizumab is that it does nothing about the underlying pathophysiology of TTP. It does nothing about the absence of ADMTS13. It does nothing about the immune-mediated absence of it. So if you don't squash the immune system, this, this we're still back to where we started. And of course, it does nothing about congenital TTP. And if we have to be complete, we don't know what are the long-term, what are the 5, 10, 20-year safety data that's behind this. It's something we have to acknowledge even though there's probably unlikely to be any long-term safety issues with it. One of the things we don't know is that, is there a potential for rebound thrombocytopenia if the ADMTS13 inhibitor has not been eradicated? The biggest thing that has been, has been come out with Kaplacizumab is the cost. It's estimated that, that the use in the hospital and then for 30 days afterwards, the cost is about $270,000. And this is what it's felt to price what it would take, what it would cost if someone relapsed and had to come into the hospital or spent more time in the hospital, in the ICU, getting more plasma exchange. However, this cost assumes that we're going to treat for 30 days. Many experts in, in, who treat TTP uh, f will frequently stop Kaplacizumab if the ADMTS13 levels have, have risen, which makes that sort of the cost-benefit analysis that have been uh, bandied around to be somewhat inaccurate in the real-world treatment of TTP. So let's move on to immune suppression. Have there been any updates on there? Well, as we've mentioned, you know, this is an autoimmune mediated attack of ADMTS13. And as we said, plasma exchange in Kaplacizumab does nothing about what led to this. So standard of care is to use high dose steroids in order to eradicate the inhibitor. But as everyone who has been on this knows, steroids can lead to a lot of, a lot of side effects. And so we use a lot of other things. And here's just, a, here's just a quick little list of all the stuff that has been used in the treatment of TTP. 
those two things on including maintenance rituximab. So even if someone has received rituximab up front, if they still have a persistent inhibitor, uh, one method is to just continue giving rituximab. And those other ones, obinutuzumab or ofatumumab, they're different from rituximab. They have the same target, but they're just modified. And they're, they've been used mostly in lymphoma treatments, but has been used in refractory TTP. So let's talk about rituximab. Originally, this was used in lymphoma, but over the last two decades, it's become more and more frontline. So that currently, the use of rituximab is now considered frontline therapy. And it has to be acknowledged, this is, this is in the absence of any sort of randomized, double-blind, prospective, placebo-controlled trials. And this is just due to the rarity of TTP. The use of rituximab has been so successful in the treatment of immune TTP that we, it's now being used, it can be used preemptively. So in other words, if we notice that ADAMTS-13 levels are starting to fall while someone is in remission, we can give another course of rituximab in an attempt to eradicate the inhibitor. And this comes from re really good studies from the uh, French Thrombotic Microangiopathy Reference Center, uh, in which they followed patients who had a persistent ADAMTS-13 deficiency. Now for usually, for many patients, the activity levels are usually above 80%. And so, I'm sorry, they're usually elevated for, uh, for over 80%. These green bars, you know, the amount of people who had it greater than 50, the red is from 10 to 50, and you can see only a minority had, had levels that were less than 10% over the course of time. And what this study did is what they noticed is that when patients at MTS-13 levels started to drop, another infusion of rituximab was given at this point where the green arrow is, and it showed that it led to a rise in ADAMTS-13 levels. And when they compared to, to patients who had been prospect, you know, historical controls, this preemptive use of rituximab, so in other words, we're not gonna wait until they have another relapse of TTP, we'll give them rituximab in, up front. This was effective in these patients, even in those who needed treatment. Well, what about the dose of rituximab? A small study was done the ART study, in which this looked at just giving 100 milligrams a week for just four doses, along with standard of care. The standard dose of rituximab is 375 milligrams per meter squared. So for most people, that first dose is more than what, we were, what was given in this study. And then there, another three doses like that was given. And the reason 375 milligrams per meter squared is given, because that's the lymphoma dose. That's the FDA approved dose for the use of, for in lymphoma and rheumatoid arthritis. And so that's what we know works and there's no evidence for us to use something else. But this small study of 19 patients was to see, well, look, would a small, would a lower dose be just as effective? And it was observed that most patients did respond whether they received this or not. But what we found is that even this low dose, and we'll zoom in for us in a second, was very effective at, at depleting the B cells, the lymphocytes that are usually targeted. And this is within one month, as you can see this one month dose, it practically obliterated. And for three months, we saw almost an absence of circulating B lymphocytes, showing that even low dose rituximab was effective in, in, in uh, suppressing the B cells. And what about another most recent update from the US TMA? This is, again, since everyone is on this call, this is a consortium of 16 centers, including Colorado, and this represents the largest group of TTP patients. And in a, in a study that was just recently published, we found that pa our patients, our African-American patients, have higher rates of relapse and a shorter relapse-free survival rate. In other words, they tend to relapse, and the time at which they do is shorter than, than those of Caucasian descent. And what this means is that we may just, that we probably need closer monitoring, probably earlier treatment. And if this occurs after a tuximab, perhaps something else might be needed. And so this is, what, this is what was found. And this is novel data. And it's thanks to the participation of our patients in the US TMA. All right, so now we'll talk about what else is left, what else is left. Here's at least one of the questions that was asked. What else are we looking at? What about the pathogenesis of, of TTP? We still don't have a good answer to the question, well, how did this happen? Of 
all the enzymes of all the targets in the body, what is the reason that the immune system has targeted ADMTS13? We don't know. In terms of diagnosis, is there a way that we can make the ADMTS13 Adam TS13 testing more available instead of sending out to just a handful of laboratories that do this? And the benefit for this is that we could rapidly differentiate the TTP from those who have it, as well as people who don't have TTP. Instead of giving them plasma exchange and steroids, they could get the treatment that they need. What is going to be the role of plasmapheresis? Will this be replaced? There's a lot of uncontrolled, a lot of anecdotal data about how caplicizumab has been used to treat TTP without plasma exchange. But the Mayari trial is, is now open and is set to answer that question, which will be a, a randomized trial of plasma exchange versus caplicizumab. So I would encourage everyone who has a relapse of TTP, if your center is has this trial open, please consider volunteering for the study. And of course, at the end of the day, are there any ways that we can get rid of this inhibitor better, particularly for those patients who have refractory, uh, who have a refractory inhibitor? And of course, issues with survivorship. Now that we have turned, been able to turn TTP from a life-ending condition into one of a chronic one, we are now we've noticed that there are a lot of issues that happen after the initial episode or a following relapse. We see in our patients higher rates of high blood pressure, development of lupus, signaling the underlying autoimmunity, and a poor quality of life. We also know that when we do specific neurocognitive testing, there's many areas that have been affected Mem in terms of memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, concentration. We see higher rates of depression and PTSD. So simply treating the platelets are not enough. And how do we move forward with helping our patients after their first or their subsequent episodes of TTP. Still areas of research, and this is why we always ask our patients to help volunteer for clinical trials and studies so that we can move this area forward. With that, if there's any questions, please let us know. Thank you for listening.